Hello there and welcome back to the Music Career Show. I'm Barry Carroll and each week I delve into the world of building a thriving music career by interviewing remarkable musicians and professionals from a diverse range of sectors. My goal is to inspire you with real life stories and glean wisdom from industry insiders empowering you to make music your livelihood. Please subscribe, review and share the Music Career Show to all your friends and as I say help me spread the love. Now, so today I have a guy that over the past decade he has been skillfully blending his passion for drumming and acting, which is an odd combination. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting into this one. So as an actor come musician, he has participated in numerous theater shows. He's dazzled audiences as a guest entertainer on cruise ships and much more besides. So this is Josh Haberfield. How are you, Josh? Hello, I'm great. Thanks, Barry. Great. So Josh, for people that um, might not have heard of you just yet, why don't you introduce yourself to the nice people? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'm Josh. Um, I work mostly as an actor musician. So in the world where it's either film, TV or theatre, where we are telling stories about people that either are real life musicians uh, who require actors to play instruments as well, or uh, especially more in the theatre world, uh, maybe stories that are used, uh, used music to help tell a through line or maybe just aids telling a through line. So there's this whole world of actor musicianship that to be honest with you, until I graduated, I wasn't really aware of, but I'd say 85% of my work tends to be because I also play the drums as well as act. Uh, so yeah, idea. it's been a really nice nook to just fall into really. Very good. So like you said, that, like you're on TV and stuff. That didn't even occur to me to like even think of some some talking points for that so let's just before before i go let, let's just like segue into that a little bit what have you been on telly what have you been sure. in on telly what have i been on telly most recently the most rock and roll job ever i've done some kids tv yes <laughs> which uh yeah for, for channel five i'm in a show called mimi's world it's a lovely little show it's like a modern day retelling of mary poppins um oh. yeah which is nice uh but then other than that good omens uh, it was one, of that. Um, the Halcyon. I've yeah, not heard that. that. No, not, it's an ICV yet, thing no. that was pit to be as good as Downton Abbey. I've never seen Downton Abbey. That whole British aristocracy thing doesn't tend to fly well with with, with Irish. Funny people, that, so. isn't it? I have not <laughs> been to it. Why? But, uh, <laughs> have you just had a lovely weekend? Oh, yeah. So for anyone, uh, for, for anyone not in the know, today is Tuesday, the 9th of May, being the the day after um, King Charles's. Um, thing coronation i keep forgetting what it's called coronation i don't know how i've managed to forget what it's called because i've not heard the end of it for the past fucking god knows how many weeks and months at this stage but um i just keep myself to myself i just keep myself to myself i have i i'm 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 uh what was it what was it that your one said i'm switzerland nice yeah that's the best Complete. way to be that's the best way to be neutral yeah. completely neutral yeah can't get yeah. into trouble either way absolutely Absolutely. Well, anyway, yeah. we're, we're 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 completely digressing. I, I we 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 started off having a lovely little chat about music, and then we went into um you being in 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 uh, the next best thing after Downton Abbey and giving out about the the monarchy. Listen, so um, that's a that, a great start with you this morning. <laughs> there's that stuff. There's that stuff. It's um yeah, it's it's a really weird one because you sort of turn up and a lot of the time you're just sat for hours and then someone shouts go and then you're playing and you might be in just a split second or something, but you and the lads have been playing, you know, on the set all day. And so it's weird. I don't really talk about it that much because I made the mistake of when I first did it, telling like my parents, so oh, I'm going to be in this TV show. And then it was a real like blink and you'll miss me thing. Yeah. Um, people were sitting there looking out for you and then they're like, yeah, I sat there watching that whole episode just to just to see Josh, and he wasn't even in it. Like he was there for ten two seconds. Like yeah, you might see my foot on the hi hat pedal, and that's like it. Um, still though, still though, still pretty famous feet. But um, exactly. Yeah, so it's a weird one. It's a weird one. So there's that stuff. But um, yeah, I do a bit of that. The theatre stuff's where I get my kicks from, really. Though. Yeah. Yeah, well, I I I know that we're, we're we're definitely going to get stuck into that because that is in in my own circle of um, music teachers here in Aberdeen, where it's 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 a bit of a topic of conversation. So I'm definitely going to get get stuck into that as we go on. But let's reverse back and the the second question I always ask after people uh, getting people to well, I suppose the first question I usually ask after asking people to introduce themselves is I ask where did music all start for you? So how did you get started? I got started. Uh... 
so in that weird time where you move from primary school to secondary school and yeah. so what you're 10 11 years old and there's a letter that gets sent home saying does your child want to sign up to any musical instrument classes i was just desperate to play the drums and i didn't really know why uh I wasn't aware at that stage of any drummers in my family. And it was just like, I really wanted it. So I taught my parents in signing me up to sort of group shared lessons, uh, which is ridiculous. I think we got about 10 minutes each once a week. Yeah. Uh, but they were like, yeah, go on then. The whole thing was, oh, you don't need your own kit. And uh, you just need a pair of sticks. So just come in and play on the school kit and it'll be great. So that was yeah. for me, really. I mean, before that, as a, as a young, young kid, I um, was always interested in singing and uh, did a few bits and bobs of theatre then, like musical theatre stuff um, mm. as a kid. But yeah, my drumming was really secondary school. Very good. And so you, you, you started those, those lessons. Did you eventually, like, I, 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 at the moment, my music school, we're trying to figure out how to do group drum lessons. And the only way that I can think about doing it is having a really big room with loads of drums in it. And uh, just the same as you would any other thing. How did you find, this is probably not going to be, if anyone listening to this, I'm sorry if you're not going to be interested in this part, but I'm really interested in it as like a customer <laughs> survey almost. How did you find the um, the group drum lessons? Did you find it helpful or did you find it more a hindrance? Did you then seek out one-to-one lessons or what did you do? Yeah, it lasted half a term and then my drum teacher rang my parents and said he needs his own hour, like, I think it's just a way of whittling out who's actually going to do it and who isn't in a way. Um, so it didn't last long for me. I was frustrated. Like we took it, it was one kit in the room, took it in turns to get on the kit, have like within half an hour, there was only three of us in there, but yeah, like it was just frustrating in a way because you just yeah. crack something and then it was someone else's go. And then you sat there drumming on your legs. Yeah, I can imagine that was that was really annoying. So did you go through um, like grades or stuff or, or grades or anything like that? Or what did you do? Yeah, so my drum teacher, um, once I was into it doing my one-to-ones, he, was, he said, right, okay, what sort of drummer do you want to be? And mm-hmm. I said, uh, I want to play in bands. That's what I want to do. He went, okay, mm-hmm. we could absolutely go through the grades or yep. I could teach you to be a band drummer and, and we could just go through the fundamentals of what that means to play with other people. And I... Yes just went yeah of course let's do that as an 11 year old you know looking back now might be useful to have some grades under my belt well i don't know i don't know actually but uh i love that he opened that to me and was just like look if that's what you want to do let's not waste our time you know yeah working out time for tea (laughs) yeah no 100 percent. well look i i I put it this way i run a music school and i've not got a single grade to my name i'm completely self-taught in every instrument that i play so Amazing. And it never really, it never really has me back. So um, I teach grades now, and I, there, there's an awful lot to be said for them. Um, but they're at the at the very end of the day, they are a piece of paper that says you can play guitar, you can play drums, you can play sure. whatever. Do you know what I mean? So being able to actually do the thing is far more important than the piece of paper that says that 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 you can do it. Um, so going through secondary school, you learned how to be a band drummer. When did you start your first band or join your first band? First band, I think probably 13 years old. And uh, me and my friend Mark had heard about this bassist that was at another school. He was at the Swanky Boys School that was like Ooh. down the road from us. And we were like, oh, what if he's a nightmare though? Because he's at that clever, clever lad school. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, we met up with him and like, I don't know, someone introduced us whilst we were Mark had this mad garden where we just used to like hang out all the time and he had, you know, the classic shed with a kit in it and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and it was like, yeah, let's, let's meet up this guy called Ed. And then we started that band and we, we prepped for battle of the bands. We won battle of the bands, much to the older kids sort of, uh, disgruntlement. Yeah. And then yeah. we actually carried on playing together us three until, well, until I was about 19. Um, we ended up doing Jesus. a couple of cool support tours. We went, we supported Electric Six, uh, did the O2 Academy with them, and we did Scouting for Girls back in the day. If anyone remembers no that, yeah. So it was quite nice, you know, old old school friends sort of cracking on and doing it for a bit, you know. And yeah. Ed's gone on now to be an incredibly successful musician. He'd be a great person for you to chat to. Actually, he 
is is incredible. And not only does his own solo project, but plays for some amazing people as a session. And, uh, yeah. and Mark works in Absolute Music, one of the biggest uh, guitar centers in the UK. So the boys have carried on in their own ways doing their thing, you know. But it's always a pleasure. Whenever we get a chance to meet up, we do little reunion gigs back at home, things like that. I love fun. that. I love that. That's absolutely fantastic. I've, I've, I've don't know if I've ever come across anyone. I'm, tr- I'm really trying to think that start that that was is still essentially for all intents and purposes in the band they start their first band. Do you know what sure. I mean? Like I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I be here all day trying to name the different bands that myself and the my mates in school started way, way back when, when you're like 13, 14 and whatever else. And just within the space of one year, I could have been in 10 different bands. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I'm I'm still like myself and, and and the boys from I live in Scotland, myself and the boys uh, that I was in a band with. One of them still lives at home, and the other one lives in Qatar now. Um, and we never really officially broke up as a band. Anytime we're together, it's very, very, very seldom um, that we're that we're all together. But anytime we are, we try and do a gig together. Um, but that that wasn't until we were like seventeen. We were like pretty much adults at that stage. Um, so that is that's lovely to hear. That you're pretty much still involved in the band that you started when you were 13, and you thought you went absolutely, on, you yeah, really it's cool great. Things. That's so cool. It's great. What was the name, of, was the name uh, of the band? Uh, Mutant Vinyl. Mutant Vinyl. That's, that's right. That's, that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Great stuff. Ridiculous. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mental. It sounds like a brew dog beer nowadays. It, it does, doesn't it? Actually, yeah. Oh, you would say that. Yeah. You're Aberdeen based, right? I am Aberdeen based. Yeah. So you obviously know about brew dog. Well, yeah, so I was in Aberdeen with uh, the tour about four weeks ago, I think. It's a shame that we didn't connect before that. I could have have come and met you. Yeah, yeah, we were at His Majesty's Theatre for a week. Yeah. No way. Jez, there you go. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time touring around the different brew dogs. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't by any chance try um, the the Black Heart, the new take on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Uh, It's not, you can't compare it to Guinness it's a completely different thing it's it's sweet it's it's thick it's not it's just I hate all the branding they've done where they're like I don't know if you saw on Twitter they went to James Gate and they held it up oh awful yeah I'm I'm, I'm a big brew dog fan and I'm a big fan of beer in general but I'm also a big fan of Guinness and not not being like a gatekeeper about it like I was really really open to it because they used to have Jet Black Heart which was fantastic yeah. it was so tasty and then they changed that it. was the one changed it. that was fantastic and then they brought out Black Heart and I was kind of like you're just making an absolute holy show of yourselves trying to compete with Guinness and I'm not being a gatekeeper I'm not just being plastic patty about it I'm genuinely no. not <laughs> just, you know I, I mean? completely agree I completely agree yeah. yeah. Well, look, the next, the next time, the next time you're in Aberdeen, we'll definitely get a couple of pints into us. Hundred percent. That'll have to happen. Mate. Yes, that'll have to happen. Anyway, there's a second segue. This is this is turning into a great little episode. We've we, we've been going on about um, politics and monarchy. Now we're talking about pints. This is fucking great. <laughs> so anyway, back to you were you, you were you were playing away with mutant vinyl when you were up up until about eighteen, nineteen, there thereabouts. When like what what was the end goal when you were in school like did you want to grow up and be the drummer for mutant vinyl or did you want to grow up and be what did you want to be what what was the plan yeah it was a tricky one i went through phases so Mm. i've always from a young age i remember just being like right i'm gonna be an actor um my mum works an actress as well and i'd sort of grown up with that around and yeah i was like well that's that's what i'm gonna do and then the more and more i started playing drums I kind of lent into thinking, you know what, actually, I want to just go and tear up festival stages and, and be a drummer, you know. Uh, so it was, it was odd. I, I sort of fluctuated between the two. Um, and it was only really when I got to 18 and I ended up getting into drama school. Uh, and I was like, right, I'm going to go train, be an actor now. And yeah. uh, the drums will be what I do for fun. You know, um, it didn't really happen. <laughs> like, no. I carried on working as a drummer whilst I was at drama school. In fact, some of these gigs I did with Mutant Vinyl were things like I would drive after finishing college to w- whichever O2 Academy we were playing at and then do the gig and then drive back through the night and make it in at 8am sort of bleary eyed and not tell yeah. anyone what I was doing. But yeah. Uh, yeah, and then as I said, after I graduated, I just uh, I suddenly, in fact, my first audition after leaving drama school was for the Blue Man Group. I don't know if you know them. Oh yeah, yeah. The, oh, oh yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, like yeah, in, yeah. 
I think they do a thing in Disney or in Universal in, in the States That's and stuff right. like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, drumming blue clowns, basically. And, yeah. um, and I was like, hang on a minute. There's like this whole world of performing as well as playing the drums. And yeah, yeah and then it just carried on from there, really. So there was no, there was definitely a time at school, I'd say 16, where I was like, yeah, come on. Got to keep wearing my skinny jeans and being a rock star. Yeah, and then, then that disappeared for a bit. And then I sort of, well, I try and merge the two as much as possible now, which is good. Yeah. So what was your first job then as like, like I'd imagine you, you kind of, as, as, as most actors, musicians, creative people do, you kind of, you, when, when you're starting out, you look for anything you can get and you take whatever you can get and you're just like, right, this is grand. This will keep me going. This might not be forever. But what was the first job that you got that you were kind of, right, this is now my niche. This is now my area of expertise. I am an acting drummer or a, a, a drumming actor. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I did a show called The Blonde Bombshells of 1943, which uh, is also a famous film of it with uh, Judy Dench in it. But um, it's okay. a story of a group of women during World War II in 1943 who decide they need to bring music back because all of the men that have gone off to war were playing all the local gigs and things like that. And all the jazz bands had disappeared. And so they were sort of, yeah, like a WI group. And they went, right, we need to put a band together. We're going to start doing, bring back some music for morale. Mm. And uh, so it's a story of eight women in that. And then my character, Patrick, comes in and uh, it's like, hey, I'm here to audition for the band. And they're like, well, no, uh, it, it's an all female band. It's like, well, yeah. what do you wear on stage during the gigs? It's like, well, we wear blonde wigs and pink dresses. He's like, ah, cool, no problem. Uh, and they're like, what? Anyway, he auditions, plays, and uh, he's a bit of a snake of a character. He, he basically is doing it to avoid signing up. Uh, he's sort of a big cowardly uh, character, yeah, but yeah. the drumming in it was great. There's loads of Glenn Miller stuff and, uh, you know, big band, old 40s jazz. And cool. uh, I was playing that with these eight fantastic actor, musician women who are just like mind blowingly talented. And that was, yeah, yeah, that was 2014, I think. And I just went, okay, great. Cool. And, 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 and then the rest is history, as I say, and you've just been, you've been doing that since. Yeah. Yeah. Just shows where they need, they need drummers, drummers That's and actors. Class. Yeah. That's class. That must be really hard. Like when you were saying about like that kind of 40s big band style, the first thing I thought of was the film Whiplash. Um, yeah yeah so it must be like quite intense stuff along those lines is it it was yeah i mean not quite as intense as the stuff that's played in that um yeah. i had to really nail into my brushwork this is the interesting thing about being an actor musician is that you play different parts from different time periods and a lot of the time you're playing real drummers as well so you need to study different styles so I've, it's very rare that i just play as me if that makes sense yeah, yeah so yeah, if yeah. i'm sat at a kit i'm you know I, well, I grew up just trying to be like Chad Smith. So I'm very much of that kind of sit upright, let's go big, hi-hat's always moving. But actually, it doesn't yeah. work for so many other styles. And so yeah. I had to really nail in my brushwork, work really hard on all of that. Um, but again, you leave that job with a wealth of new skill that you can then go yeah. on to the next. Like the next thing I was doing was a 50s thing. And so it then was like, oh, okay, I can see how 50s rock and roll drumming is that weird in-between jazz kind of, shuffle it's not quite a shuffle but it's not quite straight and and you can yeah you load up your yeah. toolbox with stuff every job to make sure that you're playing accurately cool ah that's so interesting because i all i often wonder I, I i'm i'm exactly the same as you in terms of guitar i i grew up playing like van halen and um all that sort of stuff and then nice. my first my first real job was playing in um in irish pubs in in spain and I didn't know any Irish songs. I was playing acoustic guitar. I didn't know any Irish songs. And I was just kind of like, ah, yeah, but sure. I'm a class guitar player. I can play all the all the Van Halen stuff. <laughs> it's four chord shite. It's simple. And it's not. It's not. It's, 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 it really is. It's, it's like what you're saying. You really have to learn uh, the, the the style. And then you, you, it, it makes you a better musician for it. And you you leave um, that that job and you go on to the next one with a wealth of new skills that you never realized that you, you needed or were, were going to ever... Um, or had any real intention of doing, um. So yeah, that that's 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 such a really really cool point. What what were some of the the, the cooler things that you done? You must have done something like obviously that that far east thing was class, that fifty thing was class. But did you ever do anything that was like completely mental and off the wall? Yeah, I've done I've done a few things. It's funny I've not thought about this job for a while until you've asked that question. Yeah, but um, 
there was a play called uh, Little One by a Canadian writer, and it was part of the Canadian uh, Theatre Festival that happens in London. Massive thing. Uh, right. It happens okay. every year. And the director brought me in, and the idea was it's just two people in this play, um, and he wanted a drum kit sat in the middle uh, and to live narrate the soundtrack for the entire play um, based on what the energy the actors were giving like throughout their dialogue and conversations. It was wild. It was mad. It was one of the most creative things I've ever done. Yeah. So were you sort of like, um, the terminology has left me, like the main, the main character, for lack of a better term. No, so uh, I was essentially, I was essentially a third character. So any any time that sound got mentioned, there was a whole scene. Uh, you didn't know what was going on next door, but there was a, like a lot of noise that was referred to next door. And so it was about like finding ways of creating that sound on the kit. So not a load of conventional playing. There wasn't a load of just sitting down and playing beats. It was it was a lot more kind of expressive stuff and. Um, yeah, and just building. So there's a couple of really heated scenes between the two actors and you work out how you can maybe settle into a, a rhythm going across the kit and build it and bubble along with them. So I was, I was creating a soundtrack live in the moment that wasn't ever the same. So no two shows were ever, were ever the same because the actors were so impulsive that I just had to be locked in with both of them. So it felt like you didn't breathe for like two hours. You got to the end, took your bow and you were like, Jesus. That's a yeah, lot. that sounds... That's really, really creative. I, 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 I just, I, just, I think I got, I, I, I didn't get it initially when you, when you said it, but I think I got it now. That's, um, that's, that's really, really interesting. That's so cool. In terms of like, um, let's talk about the practical side of doing that sort of theatre work. So, as an actor, um, well, let's let, let let's take the the current show that you're in, the the Buddy Holly story. What character do you play in the Buddy Holly story? So I play Jerry Allison, who uh, was Buddy's drummer. Uh, and best friend and uh, so yeah it's a really nice supporting role and obviously well most people know the music of Buddy Holly it's um, yeah it's got a solid fan base so I feel pretty fortunate to be you know recreating an amazing you know very short-lived career but uh, yeah it's the power of a lot of his songs went on to inspire so many artists that everyone else sort of loves today uh, Absolutely, but, you know yeah um it's an amazing show. I've actually been doing this show on and off since 2016. They're very oh, wow. kind and they keep having me back, which is very nice. But oh, um, good stuff. Yeah, love it. Good stuff. So you as Jerry, then what is um what what is your um input in 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 the show? Have you got speaking lines? Have you got like all that sort of stuff? So what yeah, do you do so on a basis? If you if you imagine it as uh, so. We don't really call it a musical. Sometimes the marketing says Buddy the Musical, but it's not really because the music isn't used to emote. So like in musical theatre, for example, when the whole point of people singing in musical theatre is when emotions get too high to speak, you then go into song, right? Yeah, um, okay. Whereas this, we're essentially doing the play of Buddy Holly's life. Yeah. And in that play, you see him making music. So at the start of the show, we play at the KDAV Sunday Country Party, which is very much like, so when we, when we start the show, Buddy and the boys are like 18 years old. They're, they're still, you know, ju they're not big yet or anything. They're dressed up in their little country outfits. They've been invited to play at this KDAV party broadcast on the radio. And they play yeah. about 16 bars of a country song, Flower in My Heart, which there is a recording of Buddy actually doing this. And then they right. flip into Rip It Up and they play rock and roll, which was... Not okay. Ever this is 1957. Everyone's unhappy about these three white guys suddenly playing music that is is not for them to be playing, especially in yeah. Texas, in Lubbock. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and then basically the play we go on to tell the story of how Buddy then goes to Decca and he goes and records "That'll Be the Day" there, and they say that's the worst song we've ever heard. We're not doing Imagine. that. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, well this is not working. Then they go to Clovis, New Mexico, and they meet the producer, Norman Petty, who, um, yeah, it sort of goes, right, okay, let's record the music the way you want to do it. And they re-record That'll Be The Day there. They do Peggy Sue there. They do uh, Not Fade Away. And so, yeah, you then see the progression of the band. So I'm acting in it. I'm playing Jerry Allison. Uh, so I, I say all the lines, but then I'm also doing all of his drumming as well. Yeah. Cool. That's that's so interesting. I actually, I, I, I'm ashamed to say, I don't actually really know the, the story of Buddy Holly too much, other than uh, like the 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 
the, the plane crash and all that kind of jazz. But uh, it was a plane crash, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was plane crash, plane yeah. crash cool. during a, a concert tour that he was doing with Richie Valens and the Big Bopper. That's right. It was Richie Valens. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Um, what was what was what I was trying to get at there was the practical side of things. So, me as someone that's not in the musical theatre world, but as a musician, I know what goes into actually performing at a, a a gig, a show, a concert, or whatever way you want to frame it. So me, as and I also play drums, and I so I also know what goes into doing that sort of thing. But I don't know what goes into like the actor uh, and the acting sort of thing, bar what I've seen. So in my head, I'm thinking for the acting side of things, you've got like um, costume changes, you've got, um, I, I'd imagine a, a host of other things. And as a musician, you've got things, practical things along the lines of like, if you break a drumstick, do you need to sound check? Or how do you sound check? And all, and all that kind of crack. So what I'm trying to ask is how do I even fucking? I think I know what it? you're getting at. So do you know, do if, you know what I'm trying to do? Yeah. You know what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. So we we're touring weekly at the moment, right? It's a 42 week tour, I think. It's a big yeah. boy tour most of this year. Uh, I'll talk to you like about my day, which yes. I'm about. So after I talk to you, so after I finish chatting to you today, I'm driving yeah. to our next theater, which we're at for the rest of the week. Right. So I'll get I'll get to the theater. Yeah. I'll then nip in that we have an entire like tech crew that will have been building the set and everything. Uh, uh-huh. All of the costume department will have been getting everything ready. Um, and so then first thing I do when I go in is just go and check, like the kit will be in situ, uh, but because we've got great sound team on it, who set everything up, but I always like to do my own little tweaks, you know, uh, every drummer, you know, it doesn't matter. Yep. I've had some great drum techs in the past, but actually it's, it's great to go in and just check everything mm-hmm. because 100%. sometimes things aren't quite safe. Uh, so I do that and then we go and warm up. So our choreographer leads like a physical warm up, which is a lot of stretches and stuff based as all of us as musicians in the show. So, uh, we get physically warm for it. And then, uh, there's a vocal warm up led by our touring MD because we do a lot of singing in the show as well. And then we go into sound check. So by that point, so usually that's in another room, sort of like studio theater, maybe on the side. Then we go into the main house. Everything's ready to go. And then we go through with our sound number one. We do a sound check. So that will be very much like a normal gig uh, where, yeah. you know, we'll start off with the kit. We'll go round. Uh, we'll make sure everything's sounding great with that. And then we do bass, guitars. What do we have on the show? We have uh, two saxes, trumpet, a whole load of BVs, two keys. Uh, so yeah, it's quite a big operation. Big production. Yeah. And then we just sort of top and tail. There's a few. So the end of the show is a 45 minute concert, um, which was Buddy's last concert before he got on the plane and passed away in the crash. Uh, so yeah. we recreate his last concert. Um, we top and tail some of the big numbers in that. Um, and then we nip into, and then like quite a lot of the others get released. And then the core four bands that are telling the story of the crickets. We then go through because in different scene changes, the drum kits in different positions and, you know, we have different monitoring. It's really good. Actually, me and the bassist on this tour uh, and the guitarist are all on IEMs, which I've done this tour without IEMs, just monitors before. And you're yeah. in different theaters every week, moving positions and it's hard, you know, stage, yeah, stage I can imagine gets outrageous. So yeah, yeah. we finished in sound check around six o'clock. Yeah. Then it will be, uh, into. Well, some terrible meal deal from Tesco, probably. That's the touring way. Yeah. And then, uh, and then into the dressing room, and uh, you know, 1950s. So, get shaves, get the hair all done, get that back, uh, get the first costume on. I think I wear about eight costumes throughout the show. So there's loads of quick Jeez. changes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we've and then we've got our radio mics, which we have to wear. So you feel a bit like a cyborg because you've got a radio mic on your back. You've also got your IEM pack on your back. And yeah. on sort of a belt round you, so you've got all your stuff plugged in, and then yeah, shows yeah. at seven thirty. We start the show, and uh, and yeah, finish up around half ten, and and, that's and that is the average day of no, but that's a get in day, you know. And then tomorrow yeah. we have two shows, so we have a matinee and an evening. So. Right, yeah, because that, but that 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 that's pretty much answered my question. What I was trying to get at was I was as someone that wouldn't be as in the know as like I am not in the know. I'm more I'm I'm more in the know that someone who definitely isn't in the know, but someone that definitely isn't in the know might be thinking, I might like the Josh Haberfield out there in in the world somewhere that's wanting to be and do what you're doing, but they're thinking, oh God, that's such a big long list of 
of things for me to think about. God, I have to, I have to make sure my high hat is set right before every gig and I need to think about like a change in costumes. I need to think about my lines and all that kind of crack. So it's nice, it's, it's nice to, to, to have just gone through exactly what uh, an average day is like. And I suppose then, like you're, you're saying, that's the sort of a loading day. Is every day then going to be as intense as that? Are you going to do a sound check every day and all that kind of crack? Probably not as much. No, so, you know, ideally, because we've spent the time on a loading day doing the sound check, levels mm. shouldn't really change for the rest of the week. Now, yeah. all musicians know that that's not always the case. Uh, exactly, yeah. There are so many mystery gremlins in sound equipment that, like, stuff happens. Yeah. So we might have to come in and, and touch up. But no, mainly, we um, that's the most intense day. And then sometimes we have two show days. Uh, I think I think I drum about 35 songs in the show. A lot of it's, like, fast rock and roll. So it's a bit relentless. Um so those two show days, you're definitely feeling it by the end of the day. You're yeah. going, oh, okay. That's uh, a lot of drumming. That is an a, awful lot of drumming, like. It's a lot of drumming, but there's something so strange about it. If you went and if you went and did a, you know, I, I used to do an awful lot of function stuff, and, and I do a lot of function stuff when I'm not in acting work. It's mm. lovely sort of other work to go and do. If you go and do 35 songs at a wedding or something, you don't really think much of it. You're like, actually. No, you, you don't. Know, like, to be fair. Just get it done, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, there's something about the energy you have to bring being on stage. Jerry is drumming as well as erratic. He's so fluid. He moves a lot more from the core than I would do normally. I'd normally sit quite still, but actually there's this fluidity to him, um, that I, you know, I want to emulate. There's, there's so many old black and white videos that I've just like studied to make sure I get it down. And it's nice because, you know, people pick up on it. People come to see the show, fans go, all right, you know, God, it really looked like watching Jerry up there. That's amazing. Yeah. You get that, you know. Yeah, that that's great that you go into such detail. I know myself, um, anyone that I'm into, like will, will take Van Halen. Um, I know exactly like you 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 could have taken Eddie Van Halen's hands and put it on any guitar in the world, and I'd be like, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, so nice. anyone that's into Buddy Holly in in the same way and that's into like the uh, your character Jerry, they would know it, they'd recognize that and they'd really appreciate it. It was like, ah. He's 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 not just taking the paycheck like he's he's properly properly put putting the, the I suppose you've been at it for a while now at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean things that it's funny. So I was touring with this when uh, oh god we went delving COVID too long because that seems to be the most musician chat ever. But uh, when COVID hit, I was on the road with it, and we still had seven months left of a tour. Um, yeah, and. It was weird, just like, yeah, one day turning up to the theatre and them saying, oh, you might want to take your stuff because we're not sure if we're coming back in tomorrow. And you're just like, uh, right, yeah, okay. And we thought, yeah. oh, it will last a couple of weeks, we'll be back. And obviously we weren't. But it, um, yeah. so this tour, yeah, didn't start until, when did we start this? February, we started rehearsals for this tour. Um, and so it took that long to get a tour, like, rebooked and, and back in. Jesus. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like a weird, a weird continuation. But I, on this tour, I was like, right, if I'm doing it again, uh, I want to make it the most accurate thing possible. So I got in contact with Ludwig Drums that Jerry used to play. And, uh, yeah. and I said, hey, I'm doing this. And it would be really good to get a kit that's going to be strong enough to withstand, you know, eight shows a week and touring around. But also is the yeah. truest sort of replica to what Jerry played. And they just... Yeah, yeah. The, were over the moon that I got in contact. They've been incredible. They've taken me on as an artist and helped that's design fantastic. this kit that's just like, it feels like a, a proper tribute to Jerry. You know, I, I love playing it every single show I get on it and I'm just like, oh, it sounds perfect for this music. That's amazing. That's amazing. You just need to make sure now that any, any other job you take on that the drummer plays Ludwig. I know, uh, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So uh, I'll have to do the Beatles musical next. That'd be fine. It, 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 was, it was Ringo on, on Ludwig, was he? He certainly was. You Good must man, know that. I'm, I, 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 I know that Alex Van Halen was on. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. But yeah, so just things like that that make you go, I've got to, I've got to make sure that this is the, the thing, you know. It's got to be right. Yeah. Because otherwise, what's yeah. the point? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Couldn't agree with you more. Could not agree with you more. So in terms of then what else you've, you, you've done in your career, you've also done things along the lines of like cruise ships and stuff. Was that, mm. was, 
what like did, did you do the cruise ships just like in between theaters or is this is, is there sort of two sides to it well three sides to you i suppose along with the acting and stuff yeah so the cruise ship stuff came about because there was a group of lads um that's that a great start with story. Always, that's the best start. It was a group of lads. It's a group of lads, yeah. And it's always going to be good. <laughs> so this group of lads were the year below me at drama school and they had formed like a five-part harmony vocal group doing sort of quite a lot of like Carol King stuff and some other Motown stuff. And they, they had this audition for cruise ships, but they wanted a band behind them to look like the real deal, you know. Yeah. And uh, me and my friends had set up a rock and roll band uh, just playing 50s and 60s tunes at functions, in pubs, like nothing glamorous at all. Just uh, we yeah. enjoyed that music and there was a market for it. It got, it always gets booked, you know, rock and roll. People like yeah. it. So, um, and they said, so they asked us. So us four went down to Southampton to go and play backup for, for this vocal group. And um, whilst we were there, uh, we, you know, we were just playing their 20 minute little slot at the, sh- the showcase thing that you know all the artists yeah. go and audition ships and um yeah. someone had dropped out and so steve who's the lead singer of the rock and roll band the runaround kids was like uh we could do a little bit i was like well yeah all right so what should we do yeah he was like we'll just play some rock and roll we'll just tell some of the bad jokes we do at like pub gigs i was like yeah, yeah. all right fine so we told the organizer and they went, uh, yeah, go on then, if you're sure. looks better than having a hole in the middle of the showcase. So we did. Yeah. And I think out of like 10 acts, we were the only ones that got booked from that showcase. No so even the lads that we were backing up didn't, didn't get oh, booked. No yeah, so it was a bit like, oh, God. Um, anyway, it was, a, it was a quick start. So basically, yeah, we were auditioning for guest entertainer work. But for anyone that's unfamiliar with that term, it basically means... You're not like onboard musicians because those guys are hardcore. They're amazing. The guest entertaining yeah. jobs are like a, a glorified holiday because you get flown onto the ship. You might do a week on board. And you might do two shows in that time you're on board and the rest of the time you're a guest, basically. So it really is yeah, like... I love that. I'd, I'd love that. I couldn't be arsed now with the whole six months away and, and all that kind of crack. That wouldn't yeah. suit me, but yeah, a holiday and just doing some class gigs and having the crack. That sounds like great. That just it, sounds fantastic now. It's fab, you know, like it really is amazing. But we had no idea what we were getting into, really. So they just said, oh, you've got to have two theatre shows sorted. So Steve and I uh, met up and went for a few copies, sort of, uh, for a good couple of weeks solid and put together this show that was... Um, yeah, it was a load of good rock and roll tunes that everyone knew. Elvis, Beatles, Buddy Holly, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Eddie Cochran. And uh, in between, just a load of really bad gags. But, you know, fun stuff that everyone groans at. And we were like, we think this will work. I think this will be all right. Um, anyway, off we went. And it, it went really well. And so that band is still out now. Well, there's now, that's gone from four of us to, there's now a group of about 30 of us that exist as run around kids and at the moment there's a band out on seaborne cruise lines which is like six star luxury amazing there's a band out on holland america um there's about to be another band out on piano it's just blown up into this thing which is just basically all of our mates now we've got together and gone if you're not in work and you fancy a trip away you want to go and play some rock and roll and get paid and have a couple of weeks on a ship this is it so yeah that's amazing i'm i'm super proud of that and i sort of stepped away from the organization point of view and a chap andrew came in and is managing it but i'm always there as a sort of sounding board for them now as yeah they've got stuff coming up but you know and i i still go and play whenever i fancy it they're very kind they give me first refusal on stuff as a Brilliant. og you know so uh Brilliant. yeah it's a great world that we i feel very fortunate that we tapped into it i visited i think one year i visited 26 countries in one year for work and oh. it's like Places I would never dream of getting to or going. Like uh, where? 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 Where was? Where was? Was was one of the standout places? So uh, a couple for you. So I guess like right. mads that you never think you'd end up in. We did this whole cruise that took us round Central South America. We went through the Panama Canal. We were in uh-huh. Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. Uh, you know, you're just like how? And the whole time yeah. we're being paid just to play a couple of gigs amazing you know yeah that that's so cool over this end of the world exotic is like a week in alicante 
Do you know that's I mean? it. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. And I had like I'd done a couple of jobs where I traveled around Europe before, but I never I never had the opportunity to get out. So, yeah, I've been like all over America as well with it. And um, I mean, the Caribbean during the winter, you can pop off and string a couple of ships together. And, you know, before you know it, you've you've survived winter in the Caribbean. And you've come back Indeed. to England with a lovely tan in January, ready to start your next contract. And you're like, Sad. Yeah, it's not that's, bad. It's not bad. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I love, do you know what I love about that is that when you're not on the inside of that sort of, um, when you're not in that sort of world, but you're desperate to get into it, there's this whole, because I know from my own experience, there's this whole like air of mystery as to like, oh, how have these lads figured out how to get on the cruise ships? How have they figured out to, like all this sort of stuff. And it's like, it's almost black magic for people that are trying to start out gigging and trying to actually break into making music their their, their full-time thing. But you're just sitting here being like, oh yeah, it's just myself and a group of lads and we just sort of just met at work and it just happened that way. Um, it's nice to know that it is very accessible and, and that it literally can just start as, as, as something as simple as that. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like it, it, yeah. it, all, it, it, it isn't all just like big wigs and suits, just like pulling strings and what or whatever people might might think that is going on on, on on the back end, if you get me. Yeah, totally. We um we had to because we hit it like quite green, we weren't sure really what was going on. We got picked up by an agent that was then because we just started working for one English cruise line. We were just working for PO at the start. And then we had an agent pick us up and say, Oh, you know, I'm gonna put you across all these different ships. And actually what I'd say to anyone that is getting into it and sort of reckon themselves doing it, which is totally the right way to go, if you can. I mean, having an agent opens doors, of course, but for the cruise world, if you can be in complete control of what you're doing, where you're going and, and the work you're putting out, I, I just think it's really important to hold on to that because you can end up doing stuff that maybe you're like, ah, oh, I'm not overly proud of that. Whereas what we've always maintained with this band is that we're really proud of the stuff that we put out. Um, but yeah, we actually end up losing our agent and carrying on just doing it ourselves because we realized quite quickly that was the charm of it, I think, that it was just, especially the American market. We've been really fortunate that American cruise lines really like having four British lads come on and be a bit silly because it, you know, we, we lean into that. We lean into the sort of stereotype of the Beatles going to America and, you know, everyone just having a yeah. bit of a laugh and being sarcastic and... Americans it's, love that sort of stuff. They uh, do. Us, us over in this end of the world, we are we are our own greatest export. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 a fantastic thing to go over to because I've I've gigged in America as well, and like I'm not saying that I'm any use. I'm not terrible. I'm perfectly adequate and functional. Come on. I, can, I can perform. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I I can perform. I I can do my job. But people love it. People can't get enough. Oh my God, you're Irish. Oh my great fucking whoever. Was new and Irish yeah, of guy, course, half of course. Irish, and, like, and, and then they're all half Irish, they're half Scottish, they're half English. By the time they're done, there's no American left in them. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and all this kind of crack, and oh, it's they, they, they love it. Where it's yeah, they can't get enough of of us over this end of the world, over there and the world. They can't get enough, but, and that's fantastic. So if you had to, let's try and and so you, you gave a bit of advice there to like try and keep it all as in house as possible, and to, to 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 really maintain it and be proud of it, and that's fantastic. But if you were to go even a little bit further and to reverse engineer what you eventually ended up doing, if you had to do that again and you had to advise someone how to do that and how to get into that and break into that and get to where you eventually got to, what would be the first thing that they would have to do? The first thing I would say is work out what your USP is. Work out what you're doing differently because if you want to go and work on a cruise ship, they're already full of amazing musicians. Yep. So like the onboard people are incredible and some of these huge ships as well have an orchestra they have mm -hmm. um then like a jazz trio and a rock band and a soul band and then like a party function band so there's already like what six bands already on the ship yeah so if you're going on as a band you've got to work out what your thing is so mm -hmm. ours was making sure we played you know really accurate rock and roll so that it was it was stylized as opposed to us just playing songs. So it wasn't, you know, if you might walk around the ship and you might hear Johnny Be Good three times in a day, sure, because it's a popular song and everyone loves it and it's a function classic. But we were like, right, let's make sure we're doing it right and with exactly the right yes. grooves. So yeah, but then also just working out. So our thing was the whole British humor thing, ridiculous sort of self-deprecating jokes and yeah. uh, 
and also just making sure on stage you see so many people taking themselves a bit seriously which is fine like Mm -hmm. it's good to take yourself seriously but our thing was take ourselves seriously behind closed doors and be all business getting ourselves to the point where we walk out on stage and then once we're on the stage the, the professionalism the slickness is there it's so rehearsed but it looks like off the cuff in the moment yeah boys having a laugh together so yeah, yeah i think work my one thing would be work out what you can offer that none of the other groups or, that are already on ships can do yeah you need yeah. to have a lot of yeah, and anyone thinking that 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 that's oh, how do I work out my USP unique selling point is it, it doesn't have to be anything. You don't have to reinvent the wheel with it. It can be something as simple as just like like what you're saying. Find your niche. If your niche is rock and roll, make sure you're getting it right. If your niche is like what my niche would be in uh, like Irish music and stuff like that, just make sure that you something as simple as singing in an Irish accent and not putting on an accent when you're singing can be your Absolutely. your your unique selling point. Do you know what I mean? I can't I, yeah. I can't I, I, I can't I can't tell you the amount of Irish bands that I see going around the world singing in an American accent and they talk like me. It 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 blows my mind. I don't understand why people do it, but anyway, that's that's neither that's a that's a discussion for another day. But something as as arbitrary as that can be your USP. What do you think? Do you think so? One hundred percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't have to be big. It's just uh yeah, and, and stick to it, you know, stick to your guns. Yeah. I think there's so, you know, people love to offer people advice, um, whether they're in this industry or not. That is the one thing. Yeah. All performers, you have people come up to you in the bar afterwards or whatever, and they might start a conversation by going, yeah, great show, loved it. And then by, you know, a couple more sentences in there saying, have you ever thought about trying? And, you know, yeah. you're polite and you go, thanks so much for your feedback. That's great. But actually, you walk away from that conversation. You should believe in what you're doing even more. You should go, ah, oh, well. I definitely don't want to do what they just suggested, so I'm going to crack yeah. on and keep doing this. Exactly. If you're if you're a, a self-employed bricky uh, a bricklayer, why would you take advice from uh, uh, from I, me? Music. Imagine, yeah, I walk out and go, yeah. "Oh, lovely wall building, yeah. mate. This is looking great." But I was yeah. just wondering, have you tried doing it on an angle? That might be cool. That might be cool. Exactly. Yeah. So why why should you as as a musician? We always have, us musicians are we're a funny old bunch because we never we always have imposter syndrome in the in the background of Everton being like oh well, Jesus Jim there he 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 knows an awful lot about an awful lot. Jesus maybe maybe the way I am doing it is completely wrong. Well if Jim says oh fuck the whole thing's gone. Oh, do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. um, totally. So imposter I, syndrome I, 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 is so common. Ah, it's so common. It's so common. But just, just as you say, let it, let it uh, drive you on. And on a like, so, so that's I, I think that's fantastic advice to have your USP kind of locked in and have exact and, and know who you are so that you can sell yourself. Who do you need to then speak to to get into any of these cruise ships or even any of these theater shows? Or like, do, do you know what I mean? What, what, what's the first step to actually getting on board with one of these things? Yeah. So. I know I was bad, bad mouthing big agents earlier, but if you have <laughs> if you have representation, yeah, that's always going to open doors, right? You don't necessarily yeah. have to stick with that representation. Like so, for me at the moment, I my agent very like my personal agent very uh-huh. uh, sadly had to close up her business during COVID, like so many others, uh, yeah. and yeah. so she was really sorry, and she's like, I can introduce you to some other agents and stuff, and I thought, you know what, like. It's all good. And actually during COVID, I thought I could do the whole online recording stuff. And I did a little bit of that, but actually I ended up mm. retraining as a paddleboarding instructor and worked most of COVID outdoors paddleboarding, which was lovely. And, uh, oh, you, <laughs> you know, and it was a complete move away. But then when, when the theater started opening back up and ships started happening again, I went, right, I know enough people now. I've got my network where I don't need an agent and I've booked yeah. a lot of work myself, which is great, but I wouldn't have met those people without having an agent in the first place. Yeah. You know, so sure. if you want to, if you want to, the two things are quite different. I think if you're, if you're wanting to do the, the cruise ship guest entertainer thing, sit, take, you're in a band and you're like, right, we've written this show. We want to put this on. Um, yeah. Then, then you need to look at who you can easily Google it. Just who is, uh, who's the talent booker for what cruise line. And then they always have things where you can apply to go and play at the showcases, like the one I mentioned earlier. And it's, yeah. it's as easy as that. What we found really helped us get in the door, especially with the big American ships, which do pay better, um, uh-huh. is having an amazing promo video. 
Okay, so that, probably worth throwing, throwing a couple of quid into getting a promo video. Hundred percent, and you know, calling all the favors. I've got some like dear, dear friends that run a media company that have helped me out in every That's angle of my career. They're amazing. But yeah, pull in any yeah. favors, uh, rent a space, get all of your friends in to be the most supportive audience ever. Get some vox pops after the show and get them to gush about how great it was. You know, at the end of the day, yeah. some booker in Miami isn't going to know that. It's your mum and dad talking about how great the trouble was. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'd say that's always really important. In the acting world, um, it's changed a little bit, actually, since COVID, which is really nice, I think. It's slightly more accessible. There's a lot of castings that now don't just go straight through agents. Because it used to be a casting director would have their pool of agents that they liked working with. They would get in contact with those agents and they would say, right, who have you got for me for this role? They need to be able to sing, drum, act. Uh, look like this person, great. Oh yeah, Josh will do. Get him in for an audition. Yeah. Whereas actually now there's a lot more stuff going out on Twitter. If you follow casting directors, they will put those briefs out there and they'll say, if you think you're right to this, get in contact. Uh, because oh, they know okay. so many people, like so many agents left the industry and so many people were left unrepresented. But I really like yeah. there's, um, you know, there's a bit more of a world now of, if you think you're right for a job, or if you, so if, example, if you go and see the Buddy Holly story, if you come and watch it and you go, oh, you know what? I could play Buddy Holly in that. I could do that. Hmm. Get online, go to the contact on the website and just write to them and send them your stuff because they will see you. Like they, they will see that person, whether you end up getting a job or not, I don't know. But if, if you believe in yourself enough to go, oh, I can do that and you send them some material that shows you can do that, you will, you will get yeah. a shot. Very good. Well, hopefully you've not, you, you've not just put yourself out of a job because someone else is going to look more like, like Jerry Addison than you. Listen, it might happen, and that's okay. That's how it works. <laughs> it swings and exactly. roundabouts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's some really, really good and solid advice. So if you're out there listening and you've resonated with that, stop what you're doing right now and go and act on it. Just go, ah, look, see, see, what, I, see what I did there. Go and act on very, it. Very, yeah, very, very good. I tell you what, see, I, I could do one of these shows. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to get go you on the cruise ships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going yeah, yeah, yeah. to we'll, uh... right now. <laughs> hey, I'm a better Josh Haberfield than Josh is. <laughs> Give me his job, grand job. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as I said, go and act on it right now. Go and get it done. Send the first email. You'll have to send 100 before you get one back, but it's, it, right. it's always worth sending the first one um, and, and, and getting the ball rolling. Josh, before we finish up here now, is there anything that you're working on or what's the next steps or, or what's the crack? Next steps? Well, yeah, so I'm, I'm on Buddy until uh, mid-October. So yeah, if anyone's in the UK and they fancy coming and seeing the show, who are your, a part of your listeners, do just... Um, yeah. Do, do get in touch. You can find me on Instagram and let me know. And I'm normally able to get ticket deals and things like that. So uh, if, you, if you're a musician, you want to come and watch it, then or, or anything, if you're you know, one of Barry's listeners, do get in contact with me and, and uh, say hello. And we could at least grab a quick hello at stage door afterwards or whatever. But yeah, so I'm doing that. And um, then, then what am I doing? Well, next year, actually, I'm going to be back on tour uh, in a purely acting role just for a little bit. Uh, in a play called The Importance of Being dot, 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 Ernest, uh, which is a production, The Importance of Being Ernest, where Ernest doesn't turn up. And so we end up casting a random member of the audience to play the lead role for the entire show. So that's a riot. Uh, So So keep your eyes filled for that. Someone from the audience has gone along to see this and doesn't know that they're going to be in the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they they end up playing the lead (laughs) part. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. So that's... I've got that in the bank, but then um, I've also got some stuff. I was really lucky last year. I got to Depp uh, on a gig for Albert Lee. I don't know if you know the legend. Yeah, Albert country Lee. guitar was, player. Yeah, yeah. So Albert um, is 79 years old, still getting strong, still gigging. Yeah. Leads, and he actually took over when Buddy dies. He took over playing in the crickets. So oh. he, you know, he's a legit real life cricket alumni and through the buddy holly story my connections there he was like best friends with jerry allison jerry allison only sadly died last year and i'm so gutted i never got to meet him but one of the things that did happen through that is albert was doing some work that jerry was going to be in the uk he was going to do some drumming for jerry wasn't there so i ended up being recommended and so i went and drummed for albert and it was you know incredible it was a real pinch me moment i was there playing songs that i've been playing for years uh, but with the actual, the real deal, you know, yeah. so it's like, 
But um, yeah, so Albert's uh, doing some more touring and I'm jumping on some gigs with him as and when I can. Um, cool. Just like such a pleasure to, he's one of those people that you just watch and you're like, oh, okay. You know, yeah. legends that we need to yeah. jump at any chance to play with. Absolutely. They don't, they Absolutely. Great. That's class. That's so cool. That's so, so cool. Great. Well, look, I wish you the, the absolute best of luck with that. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing all about we'll, uh, all about it. We'll have to get you back on this time next year to chat all about that and tell us all the stories about Albert Lee. Because I'd imagine he's still... Uh, he, 79 means nothing. Like, do you know what I mean? He's still probably... He's an incredible. Rock star, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you put a guitar around his neck. He's very quiet, very reserved. Put a guitar around his yeah. neck. He's, a, he's no, wild. Uh, so yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, so we're up in, um, where are we near you? I come to Inverness in the summer, actually. So if you fancy are a you little in trip. Inverness in the summer? To Inverness. Yeah. Come and see the show. 40%. Let me know. I will. Be good. I certainly will. Yeah, I'll take a guitar with me and sure, I'll, 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 I'll I don't know. <laughs> I'll just take a guitar with me and look like a pleb when no <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, no yeah, one wants absolutely. to be right. Just come cool. right, well, what? Let's let's. Yeah, well, let, let, let's let's finish off here with a, a a very quick quick fire round. As I always say, these are like um uh these are like kind of icebreakers at at the end, um just cause you know yourself, um cool. So, question one: tea or coffee? Coffee, coffee. Good man. Now I had this this question in here for um a, a guest last week that was that was Irish and had written in Tato or King, but that doesn't really uh, for crisps. Just in case you didn't uh, know that. Oh, I got and it. I, I got it. Ta- you got it, have you? Yeah. Which one, Tato or King? Tato. 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 Correct. Yeah. Good man. Sure. <laughs> I, I was back. shooting a. Uh, I was shooting in in Belfast for like two months last year on a on a TV yeah. show and. The catering was full of taters. There was, you know, packets of them flying around everywhere. Can't bear a tater, lad. It's it's it, it is a well known um and well and, and undisputed fact that tater are unbeatable. It's just a fact, and it, it, it yeah. There you go. Anyway, um, now here's an interesting one for you. I've asked this to a lot of people, but I think this is going to be really interesting for you. If you could live in any era, which would you choose and why? Bearing in mind now that you have played people from millions of eras. Uh, 60s. 60s, yeah? Why 60s? Imagine being in the 60s Liverpool like beat scene coming up and being in that like underground cabin scene playing in bands then. Oh, it'd be great. That'd be class. you get to go to Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That'd be, that'd be class. Cool. Right, tell you what, let's, let's do one more. Let's do one more. This has turned into my absolute favourite question over every... And, and, and believe it or not, the first one I ever asked was um, Leilani, our uh, mutual friend. I asked her this. Great. This was the first time I ever asked this question. What celebrity would you like to fight? I remember hearing this on Mulani's episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness. Um, she said someone really funny, didn't she? She said Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken. Bless him. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> uh, what celebrity would like to fight? Um, Jack Whitehall. Oh yes. Why? Why yeah. Jack Whitehall? Oh, I just find him infuriating. Oh just, well, look. You I, know what? This, well, is, this, 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 this is the first time that this could actually be possible because you live in London, and I'm going yeah. to guess Jack Whitehall is not too far away. Do you know what I mean? So Jack, not. if you're listening. Step out for belts. Come on, you've been called out. Go and defend your honor. Like the, I don't know. I don't even, I, I can't even think of, of an appropriate thing to, to say about him. I don't mind Jack Whitehall, actually, I have to say. I, I liked him in, um, in, uh, in Fresh Meat. Uh, but I'd imagine this that's exactly thing. what he's like in real life. There's, there's no disputing he's excellent what he does. And everyone can't get over the fact that, that <laughs> I have this problem with him. For me, it's just mm-hmm. whenever I see him on a panel show, if things aren't like it going, if the conversation isn't flowing in a way that he feels he can chip in, he'll steer it round so he can tell a bit that he's already got prepared. And that just does my head um, in. I'm like, no. I know what you just, mean. <laughs> it's mad. It's, I know it's what you mad. mean. I've really like, let go of a thing here. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's like. Have you remembered that I'm like I'm 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 a funny person and I think of funny things for um for 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 a living. You're not really working with me. Come on, sort yourselves yeah. out. Like, do you know what I mean? So yeah, you you said this thing over here about climate change, but what about those Russians from medieval times? It's totally. Do you know, yeah. that that's yeah. so. Like, I I don't know. I'd be a terrible comedian. I can't really think on on the fly at all. 
the cleverest thing I've ever said was literally just there 10 minutes ago and I said act on it so that's that's the pinnacle of my to be fair uh, that was good wit. but anyway I, I, well look I'm going to be um, dining out on that for the rest of my life because as I said that is the absolute pinnacle of my wit so um, and it's the cleverest thing I've ever said and only you and me have heard it we're, we're around to hear it but it's okay because it's recorded it's all good um, anyway before I, I, I talk us into an absolute coma, before we let you go, Josh, where can people find you if they're wanting to get in touch with you? You mentioned Instagram, but where else? How do people get in touch with you? Yeah, so uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, I'm the same everywhere. Uh, so I'm just at Josh Haberfield, uh, which I imagine the perfect correct pronunciation and spelling will be in this uh, <laughs> in the details of this podcast. <laughs> but yeah, you can find me on it there. And uh, yeah, I, I always enjoy like, do feel free to reach out if you've got any questions, if you're like starting up because it's great. And I did it. I continue to do it now. I continue to just message people because at the end of the day, the whole thing is kind of about who, you know, not what, you know, and it's, um, mm-hmm. it's good to make connections everywhere. You know, it's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Josh, you're an absolute gentleman. Thank you very much. My pleasure.